Good morning. I'm, Wen I'm Wendy Strothman, class of 72 and um, outgoing co-chair of the Brown 250th. As we reach the end of the celebration of Brown's 250th anniversary, it gives me special pleasure to introduce David Kurtzer, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for his new book, The Pope and Mussolini. David epitomizes what makes Brown so special. He's a 1969 graduate of the college, and his wife Susan graduated from Brown in 1970. Both of their children are also alums. David has a distinguished publishing record, which you can find on his website, but I'll mention one highlight. His book, The Kidnapping of Edgardo Martara, which is in the bookstore, uh, was a National Book Award finalist and is being developed into a major motion picture um, by Steven Spielberg and Tony Kushner. After earning his PhD at Brandeis and teaching at Bowdoin College for nearly two decades, David returned to Brown to join our faculty in 1992. And then Ruth Simmons tapped him to become provost in 2006, just before the financial crash. <laughs> in spite of all that, David spearheaded projects and improvements too numerous to name, including the building that we're sitting in today. As a measure of how effective he was, the Brown Daily Herald in its April 1st, 2008 issue reported that Kurtzer must have taken, quote, provost performance boosting steroids, <laughs> because that would be the only explanation for his transition from a, quote, mild-mannered Bowdoin professor to the academic behemoth he became at Brown. But little did they know what he would do when he could start writing again. David returned to his research and writing in 2011, and we're all the beneficiaries of that. His work shows what happens when church and state are not separated, when religious authorities have civic power, and when certain individuals think they have special access to God's will. The Pope and Mussolini is also a rollicking good story. David's work shows what insights can come from this painstaking work of a true scholar doing the true work of this university. David. Oh, good. Put back on. Well, thank you. Thank you, Wendy, for that nice introduction. And uh, congratulations to all the parents here and alumni returning for your uh, reunions. Um, what I want to do today is give you a little bit of a sense of how I went about do, writing this book and some of the intriguing uh, new sources that are now available if you're interested in this kind of history, and then give you a glimpse of the actual story without giving away too much of it. Um, so what is the, the basic context is a series of questions I think have long intrigued people ever since World War II. Uh, the questions are, how could the fascist regimes have arisen in the middle of advanced Europe in the 20th century? And then secondly, how did the, that phenomenon of the fascist regimes lead to the tragedy of World War II and the Holocaust. As we look at those large questions, obviously there are many different factors that contributed to them, but certainly one that's attracted a lot of interest and, and attracted my interest is the role of the churches in general, and in particular given my uh, special interest in Italy, the role of the Vatican and the Roman Catholic Church. Now, uh, the controversies over this, I'm sure, are well known to, to most of you. Uh, you see here in the middle a play that came out in 1963 by a German playwright, uh, Ralph Hochuth, uh, the deputy, which basically led to the charge that the pope during the war, Pope Pius XII, was criminally or at least uh, morally uh, reprehensible for being silent during the Holocaust, never speaking out against it as it took place. This, of course, led to uh, a rather a very heated debate with great defenders of the Pope and others charging him uh, with inadequate uh, response to this crisis of European uh, and Christian civilization. Then uh, about 15 years ago or so, John Cornwell came out with his book, you see there on the left, Hitler's Pope. The title itself is rather uh, you know, kind of provocation about uh, Pius XII dealing with these same issues. Now the fact that Defenders of the Pius XII haven't stood still is most recently evident in a film that just came out, came out in Italy. It's about to have its premiere, I think, in the US soon. In fact, 
A press release said that the Pope, Pope Francis, who's supposed to visit the US this fall, is supposed to see the film in Philadelphia. Um, and this uh, film you see on the right, so kind of a major commercial film in Italy, is, shows Pius XII wearing a Star of David, showing his great solidarity with the Jews during the Holocaust and making the claim that he actually saved millions of Jews. So there's no lack of controversy, no lack of disagreement about what actually happened in these fateful years. Now, most of uh, this subject of the church and fascism and the Holocaust has focused understandably on the relationship of the Vatican with uh, Adolf Hitler and with the Nazis. But there's another side of the story, the one that I tell in this book, that I think is absolutely crucial to understand if we're going to understand the larger story. And that is the relationship between the Pope and the Vatican in the 1920s, 1930s uh, with Mussolini, Italy's dictator, Benito Mussolini. After all, Mussolini was the role model for Hitler. Hitler, in the 1920s, headed a small uh, right-wing splinter party. And in his Munich office, he kept a big bust of his hero, Benito Mussolini. Mussolini had uh, take, founded his own party and, in very short order, come to power in Italy. And this, of course, was what Hitler was hoping to do in Germany and would 11 years later, in 1933. Now, I had long been interested in questions of politics and a religion in Italy, and I'd worked in the Vatican archives for many years. But the church archives for these fateful years, these dramatic years, the 20s and 30s, had long been closed, had always been closed, until in 2002, the then pope, John Paul II, announced he was authorizing the opening of those years. The way the uh, archives of the Vatican work, it's up to the current pope to open the archives for the next papacy whose papers are not yet available. So the pope in 2002 authorized it. It would take another four years, though, of putting the material in order before scholars would be allowed into the Vatican archives for these years in 2006. Well, as soon as uh, I heard this news, I decided I wanted to be one of the first people in those archives. There were so many controversial questions, so many important questions that could only be really answered once we had access to the church's own papers for these years. Uh, now, although they would only actually open these uh, papal archives, these Vatican archives in 2006, uh, the archives on the other side of the equation, on the fascist regime, those papers, Mussolini's papers, uh, they were already available in the state archives. And uh, fortunately, in 2004, I guess it was, 2004 or 5, I had a sabbatical. And so we spent the year in Italy, and I began working in those archives. I want to give you a little bit of idea of what that involved. The main state archives, so again, a beginning in the civil archives, waiting for the opening of the Vatican archives. This, the Archivio Centrale dello Stato, the Central State Archives building, looks, it's quite recognizable as fascist architecture. Uh, a kind of classic instance. In fact, some of you who know Rome know this is in Aur. It's in a part of Rome that was developed by Mussolini for what he thought was going to be his triumphal 20th anniversary in power in 1942. He built this building and others around it in this style. Of course, that World's Fair never took place because of the war, but the building remains, and it, it houses the Central State Archives, which include uh, Mussolini's papers, and not just Mussolini's papers, but something, uh, I have to be careful because I tend to get very excited when I talk about this, but it's a little perverse, uh, namely the uh, secret spies in the Vatican, and, and more generally in Italy, that uh, Mussolini put into practice and was key to the repressive nature of the fascist regime. So what those consist of are thousands and thousands of what they call fascicoli folders, uh, each one with a different name. So these are the people uh, for whom we have spy reports, secret police informant reports. Some of these folders have hundreds of pages that go over many years of police surveillance. Now Mussolini was uh, very interested, in, especially interested in what was going on in the Vatican. And Every morning, his first meeting of the morning in his office was the police chief, the Italian police chief, would come with a sheaf of these reports for him to read. Uh, I think we have, there we are. 
is actually fairly early on. You can see how young uh, Mussolini was only 39 when he came to power in 1922. Uh, and so he would kind of age in place there. Uh, but this is showing Mussolini at his desk. He, he uses uh, only pen colored pencils. He also, he wouldn't buy a pad of paper. He was very economical. So he'd use like the back of his you know, daily schedule or something to keep his notes. Um, so you can tell, and this is you know, one of the thrills of working in the archives when you have in your hands something that Mussolini uh, had in his hands and has written something on. You can tell what he's written because it's written either in blue pencil or red pencil. So this is him at his desk. He's getting these uh, police informant reports. What this means is for these years, the 1920s and especially the 1930s, we know more about the intrigues in the Vatican, the kind of backstabbing, factional battles, uh, various scandals than we do for any other time in Vatican history, the almost 2,000 years of the Vatican. So in this uh, first year, I, I worked through these kinds of materials. And let me give you an idea of what I found in those secret police archives. Uh, before the opening of the Vatican archives, I talked to the prefect, the bishop, who's the head of those archives, the longtime head. And I asked, is everything going to be made available at the Vatican uh, to scholars? Uh, and he said, virtually everything. Um, the one thing he pointed out that would not be made available is what he called delicate personnel files. At the time, I wasn't quite sure what he meant. It was kind of later years when the uh, church sexual scandals um, became so much in the news that this began to come a little bit more into focus for me. So let me give you an example of what you will never find in a Vatican archive, including after they were open. These are not to be found there, but thanks to the fascist archives, thanks to the Mussolini spies in the Vatican, we now have access to this part of what was going on there. The person, there are various examples of this, but this I think is the most notable one. Uh, the man who kept the Pope's schedule, he was, his title was Prefect of the Papal Household. He was a bishop uh, initially, and who literally would be seen at the Pope's side for most of his meetings during the day. So he's in you know, thousands of photographs with the Pope. Was, it turns out, uh, a, a pedophile, pederast, who would lure boys to his rooms in the Vatican, um, ply them with liquor, engage in uh, sexual activity with them, then pay them off and warn them what would happen if they were to say anything about what had happened uh, to anyone. Now, as I say, um, in the Vatican archives, the what's called the fascicolo personale, the, the personal file on him of the uh, police, and of course, you do have to take these reports with a grain of salt. People are trying to settle scores and so on. So what, as a historian, what you need to do is be sure there are many different accounts by different people in different situations all pointing to the same behavior, which is what we have in this case. We have many, many different informants over a period of years uh, referring to very similar uh, behavior. And um, at one point, the pope actually holds an investigation of this man. Let's see if uh, here's a, uh, an example of one of these police reports. And this is a case of, um, this is a little bit unusual because it involves actual police activity. It's 1938, and uh, this, uh, he's by now become a cardinal, Cardinal Katja, uh, has, uh, comes up into the police file because a young boy is on a bus in, um, in Rome, and the policeman's on the bus and sees he has a, a couple of cartons of cigarettes, and the policeman notes the cigarettes didn't have the you know, sticker that shows they had paid the tax. So he accosts the boy and um, kind of arrests him. And the boy says, what, you know, don't blame me. These were given me by a very important person in the Vatican. So they're skeptical of the story. He's, they say, well, who? And he says, Cardinal Katja. They telephone Cardinal Katja. And he says, yes, he knows the boy. Yes, he did give them the cigarettes. Let that boy go. And then the end of uh, the report, as you see here, concludes, uh, since Katja is a well-known, uh, well-known to be a pederast, uh, his offer of these cigarettes is easily explained. The next year, by the way, 
Cardinal Caccia, who's the highest ranking cardinal in the Vatican by now as a cardinal deacon, uh, he's the man there on the left with the uh, white miter on his head, left to our left, to the right of the new pope, is uh, the man who physically puts the uh, crowns the new pope, Pius XII, as pope uh, in 39. So these are the kinds of materials you can find in these secret police reports. Now, before I turn to the actual Vatican archives, uh, let me mention one other very important source in the state archives for these years to get at this relationship between the Pope and Mussolini, the Vatican, and the fascist uh, regime in Italy. Uh, again, let me just remind you, 1922 is the year both uh, Achille Ratti becomes Pope, so Pius XI becomes Pope early in 1922. It's later that same year you have the March on Rome of the fascists, and Mussolini comes to power. Uh, as Prime Minister of Italy, initially in a semi-legal uh, fashion, semi-constitutional fashion, before he turns everything into a fascist dictatorship. The um, other archive I wanted to mention, this state archive, is the archive of the Foreign Ministry, which is actually found in the current building of the Italian Foreign Ministry in Rome. Uh, to understand that, let me just a brief historical parentheses. Uh, people tend to think of Italy as an ancient nation. In fact, a modern Italian state was only created in, the, in 1861 when the Kingdom of Italy was proclaimed. Before that, Italy, the Italian peninsula, was a patchwork of different duchies, kingdoms, foreign enclaves. And the drive, the uh, term risorgimento is used here, the drive to unify Italy was faced as its major obstacle, the Vatican, the Pope, the Church, which ruled over the papal states, which stretched from Rome up through Ferrara, Bologna, and which would have to be brought to an end in order to unify Italy. Uh, so just to you know, telescope this history, uh, in 1861, the kingdom of Italy is proclaimed, but still the region, Rome and the region around it, is in the pope's hands, protected by French troops. It would only be in 1870 that Italian troops would literally break through the walls of Rome capture Rome, make it the capital of Italy. The Pope then, Pius IX, retreats to the Vatican, proclaims himself a prisoner of the Vatican, a term he uses. And for half a century, no Pope would recognize the legitimacy of the Italian state, called on Catholics not to vote in Italian elections, not to run for parliament. Uh, and it would only be, as we'll see, through Mussolini and the fascist dictatorship that uh, that would end, the hostilities between the two would end. So what happens in 1929, a concordat, a treaty, the Lateran Accord, is signed between Mussolini and the Pope, and it's that 1929 Lateran Accord that establishes Vatican City for the first time. There is no Vatican City as a sovereign entity before then. And with it, and this is why I'm giving this preface, there's a diplomatic relationship established so that there's a nun papal nuncio sent to represent the pope with the Italian state, and the Italian state appoints an ambassador to the Holy See. So if you go now, as I did, uh, to the foreign ministry archives in Rome, they have thousands of documents detailing the relationship between the pope and Mussolini from the point of view of the new, as of 1929, Italian ambassador to the Holy See. Let's see, I've got, yeah, just here are the, uh, the first two ambassadors whose papers are relevant uh, for the 19, uh, from 29 through the 30s. On the left, Cesare da Vecchi, he's the first Italian ambassador to the Holy See. He was one of the so-called uh, quadrumvirate that uh, were in charge of the fascist march on Rome. Um, he had been the fascist chief of Turin responsible for various massacres there. And uh, on the right, uh, you have the, who, the man who, by the mid-30s, became the second ambassador, a career diplomat, uh, Pignatti. He's there talking with, uh, I don't know if any of you recognize this or remember this from history, but uh, Galeazzo uh, Ciano was the uh, son-in-law. He'd married Edda Mussolini. He'd married Mussolini's daughter and remarkably had a um, rapid rise to uh, office, um, and by age like 35 became the number two in the government as the, the foreign minister. Uh, so that's who uh, the ambassador is talking to here. 
Well, let me give you uh, an example of what uh, one can find, what I found in these archives of the foreign ministry. And the example I'll give is from the Ethiopian War. In uh, the fall of 1935, Mussolini launches an invasion, Italian invasion on Ethiopia. The League of Nations, of which, by the way, Ethiopia was a member, pronounces a boycott, an economic boycott on Italy, uh, which is making life very difficult for the Italians and for Mussolini. Mussolini is very worried that the United States will join the boycott. Remember, the United States was not a member of the League of Nations. And so he sends his ambassador to uh, talk to uh, talk to the representative of the Pope, and in particular to the head of the Jesuit order to get help. So he gets help from various sources of the Vatican. I'll just give one example of this help. There are many examples. Uh, in January, in the middle of the war, January 1936, Mussolini is enraged to learn that the Jesuit, uh, American Jesuit journal, America, some of you may know, it still publishes, magazine, um, has published an article critical of him, of fascism, of the Ethiopian war. He immediately dispatches uh, Pignatti, his ambassador, to meet with the world head of the Jesuit order, so the, the American Catholic periodical America is published by Jesuits, he calls in the world head of the Jesuit order, and he uh, tells him, the ambassador on Mussolini's behalf, tells him to do something about this, that they're being criticized in the pages of a Jesuit journal in the United States, that this is not going to help American support for the Ethiopian war. And what I have, uh, this is the man he meets with, the longtime worldwide head of the Jesuits. And what he finds is a very eager, uh, almost fawning kind of reception. And the, the uh, Lederhowski tells him that he will immediately fire the Jesuit, who's the head of the American Jesuit publication America, and replace him with a pro-fascist Jesuit, which he does. Many examples of this kind of thing during the Ethiopian uh, War of the Vatican helping Mussolini gain support in the US for the war, or at least prevent uh, any US act joining of the, of the boycott. Now, by the time the uh, Vatican archives actually opened in 2006, I'd already uh, copied and uh, prepared digitized versions of 15,000 pages of archival documents from the state archives that I had selected. And by the way, if anybody's interested later, uh, we can talk about it, the role that computers now play in allowing uh, historians to do work that they never really could have done uh, before. I'm just dealing with the, the mass of material in itself. I, I get another 10,000 pages digitized of, of Vatican documents that I was working with later. So I ended up with 25,000 pages just of archival documents. Then there's, of course, all the published material as well. Well, the um, most important of the Vatican archives that became available for this period is called the Archivio Segreto Vaticano, the Vatican Secret Archives. And you see it here. It's in an internal courtyard of the Vatican where one goes to consult it. Uh, you see its frescoed ceilings. It's really quite a place. Got a certain notoriety. Those of you who uh, read the book or saw the, the uh, Dan Brown film, Angels and Demons, they have a kind of dramatic scene. Doesn't really correspond to what this is actually like, but it uh, brought attention to the Vatican secret archives. What the Vatican archives allows, uh, allowed me to do was to triangulate documents both from the fascist regime perspective and from the church perspective on the same events. And this is crucial. Now, you'd think this would be obvious. I mean, I think it is kind of obvious that you'd want to do that. But strangely, it's very little done by people who work in this history. You have two different traditions. On the one hand, there's the tradition of uh, church historians. Who are doing the history of the church in Italy or the history of the uh, papacy. Those historians work almost exclusively in church archives. It's very rare for a church historian, I mean, there are obviously, there are some exceptions, but it's rare for a church historian to work also, let's say, in a fascist archive, state archive. Flip side of that is the um, Italian historians tend to be secular and often tend to write a kind of patriotic history, 
uh, they, many of them would not be caught dead in a Vatican archive. It just would be very, very uncomfortable for them to go into a Vatican archive. Uh, so one of the things I've tried to do in a number of my books is to kind of take advantage of this, you might say, opening, historical, historiographic opening, to see what I could do by putting together documents from the state side and from the uh, Vatican, from the church side, and see what kind of new light might be shed on the events of the time. Now, a nice example of how this triangulation worked uh, is provided uh, with a secret envoy that Mussolini and the Pope had, or a, a go-between that they had. Uh, within a couple of months of Mussolini come, coming to power, so in January of 1923, Mussolini comes to power in, uh, in late November of the previous year. And so early 1923, there's a meeting Mussolini has with the number two in the Vatican, the Cardinal Secretary of State, and they decide it would facilitate their relations to have a, a personal envoy from the Pope to the dictator. They choose a man, a Jesuit, Pietro Tacchi Venturi. He was a very prominent uh, Jesuit in Rome. And amazingly, one of the things I discovered was that he would meet over 100 times one-on-one -on -one with Mussolini. Nobody met that often with Mussolini other than his own you know, fascist group. So what would happen is basically every month for 17 years, uh, the Pope would call would summon this Jesuit and give him basically a kind of laundry list of demands for Mussolini. And this, this is important because it explains something that otherwise is perplexing. Why would the Pope want to enter into alliance with this fascist dictator? I don't want to get into this story right now. It's obviously a major theme in the book. Um, but the Pope knew that Mussolini was from a deeply anti-clerical background. In fact, Mussolini had previously been head of the uh, left wing of the Socialist Party. He wasn't just a socialist, he was a left wing socialist, um, until he made a radical change during World War I and be founded the uh, fascist movement in 1919. Uh, he was a notorious anti-cleric. Uh, why would the Pope turn to him uh, to be an ally? At that time, the church had its own Catholic party, and one of the things this alliance would mean was uh, the, the uh, church, the pope would pull church support from the Catholic party, which was headed at the time by a priest, the uh, popular party. Well, the, the explanation in part is that the pope saw that this man, Mussolini, could do for the church something that no previous prime minister of the unified Italian state had been able to do, be able to restore many of the privileges uh, of the church in Italy. And of course, from Mussolini's point of view, he desperately needed church support and Vatican support. And so he was, despite the fact he didn't have a religious bone in his body, he was uh, eager to do what it took to win uh, the backing of the, the pope. So what did the pope gain? Well, every month, he would now call Taki Venturi in. He would give him a laundry list of what he wanted the Mussolini to do. What did this consist of? Uh, for example, the Pope was almost obsessed with the threat of proselyt pros Protestant proselytizing in Italy. If he heard a report that Protestants were proselytizing somewhere in Italy, this would be on the list. Mussolini should send his uh, people to put an end to it. He was also concerned that former priests were teaching in the public schools of Italy. From the point of view of the Pope, if someone left the priesthood, they should not be seen in public, certainly not be seen by youth. So when he heard reports of this, he would call on Taki Venturi to tell Mussolini, take action, have this teacher fired. Um, there's also things like, um, well here, just give you an example, this is a feel for the documents in the archives. Uh, so here you have a letter, you see it's signed by Pietro Taki Venturi, uh, asking to, to Mussolini, asking for a meeting, saying the Pope has just uh, called on him to have a meeting. And note the colored pencil. Remember, I mentioned the colored pencil. That is Mussolini's check mark. And then uh, on the top, uh, you see written by his assistant, Oji, uh, today. So no sooner does he ask for a meeting than it's usually either Oji or Domani, tomorrow. So these meetings take place very uh, quickly. And then this, uh, you don't see a lot of photographs in the Vatican archives but I found this kind of uh, revealing, you might say. Um, in August 1933, the bishop from Capri, 
uh, sends this is alarmed. He says, it's a scandal what's going on here. These women, uh, by the way, he says, they're not women from around here. They're not southern Italian women. They're from northern Italy. Uh, come to the island of Capri and wear these you know, scandalous clothes. And so he, he had his own spy service, I guess, and uh, for the bishop and took these pictures, which he sends in and says, to the, uh, to the Vatican Secretary of State office, says you've got, the Pope has to do something to put an end to this. And so this gets added to the list of what the Jesuit envoy then takes that month to Mussolini to, uh, to have him deal with. Now, in May 1938, Hitler visits Italy. A, goes through a kind of triumphal procession through the streets of Rome and Naples and, and Florence. Uh, and here we have a picture in, in Rome. This would be followed just two months later by the announcement that would shock the Jews of Italy, the pronouncement of a new racial doctrine mimicking the Nazis. This racial doctrine uh, claim that the Italy's Jews, who had after all been there for over 2,000 years, were not real Italians. They belonged to a foreign, noxious, threatening race. And it seemed to be only a matter of time until a set of laws would come into play that would be uh, unfurled to persecute Italy's Jews, which in fact would, would take place shortly. Now, the Pope was the Pope, first of all, Pius XI, remember he became Pope in 1922, he would serve till 1939. Um, the Pope despised Hitler. He thought Hitler the kind of prophet of a pagan religion uh, who is, among other things, persecuting the Catholic Church in Germany. And so he had been very upset as Mussolini, with whom he did have a, uh, a strong alliance, as Mussolini was getting ever closer to this man he hated uh, Hitler. He was not at all happy by the triumphal reception that Hitler was given in Rome. In fact, he fled Rome himself. The Pope went to Castel Gandolfo to the summer abode of the Popes, and so he wasn't in uh, Rome. He closed down the uh, Vatican museums and so on because you know Hitler, the famous art lover, couldn't go see the Vatican museums. And as Mussolini, as, uh, Mussolini was about to unfurl his anti-Semitic laws to, to trot them out, he was worried that the Pope might speak out against his evident alliance with Hitler and his racial campaign. This was going to be a special problem because it wasn't going to be easy for Mussolini to convince the Italians that they should get in bed with the Nazis. I mean, for one thing, they just fought a war against them in World War I against the Germans. Uh, secondly, when the, uh, Hitler and his cronies talked about the superior Aryan race, uh, not that many Sicilians thought that's who he had in mind. <laughs> so, so Mussolini was very concerned that he was going to have, continue to enjoy the support of the church as he trotted out this uh, racial campaign, and as he continued his alliance with Hitler. But he used to like to boast, Mussolini liked to boast to Hitler, this is one of the things I discovered, that he knew how to control the Pope. That's what Mussolini said to, to Hitler. He knew how to control him. And he knew the Pope's weak point from his perspective. The Pope's weak point was the lay organization of Catholics called Catholic Action. Catholic Action is the organization of laity. It's under ecclesiastical control, organized down to the local parish level. And from the Pope's point of view, this was the most important instrument, weapon of the church in spreading uh, Catholic influence in Italy. It was the only mass membership organization allowed to function in fascist Italy outside of the fascist party. And so Mussolini was never all that happy about it anyway, but he knew that all he had to do was apply pressure on Catholic Action to get concessions elsewhere. So this is what he did in the summer of 1938. He began making threats that, gee, wasn't Catholic action going beyond their, uh, their mission, religious mission, to get involved in political activities? Maybe it should be shut down. Well, as a result of all this, uh, the Pope sends his envoy, we saw before the Jesuit, Taki Venturi, to go work out an agreement uh, that would protect Catholic action. So he went, goes and talks with Mussolini, and they come up 
in mid-August 1938, the dates are very important because the anti-Semitic racial laws would begin to be um, come out in early September, a couple weeks after this. And what you see here, it's actually, I just show you the point one. This document has three points. Points two and three uh, basically say, if the church agrees to point one, if the pope agrees to point one, then point two and three come in effect. And point two and three basically say, we're, Mussolini is going to allow Catholic action to continue unimpeded its activities. In exchange for that, the pope is required to agree, which is signed to here by the pope's emissary, uh, Taki Venturi, that the pope will not criticize the anti-Semitic laws that are about to be announced. And the uh, first paragraph here says, or, or one of the paragraphs says, as for the Jews, the distinctive caps of whatever color will not be brought back, nor the ghettos, much less will their belongings be confiscated. The Jews, in a word, can be sure that they will not be subjected to treatment worse than that which was accorded them for centuries and centuries by the popes who hosted them in the eternal city and in the lands of their temporal domain. Now, just to, for those of you who don't know uh, too much of this uh, background, the, um, back from the mid-1500s, the popes had ghettoized the Jews in Rome. They were only allowed to live in ghettos. They weren't allowed to have social contact with Christians. They weren't allowed to practice professions and so on. They weren't allowed to go to schools with Christians. And so what this document does is Mussolini says, I'm going to bring back basically the anti-Semitic laws that were in uh, for 300 years, in effect, uh, imposed by the popes until 1870, the Italian troops broke into Italy, freed the Jews from the ghetto, and ended, uh, introduced a separation of church and state, and ended the persecution of the Jews. Now, uh, this, the, they also, the fascist regime began a publication, an anti-Semitic publication to spread the uh, anti-Semitism among the Italian population. And this, this uh, is from there, the November issue showing what the restrictions on the Jews were. So all the Jewish children were kicked out of school, the Jewish teachers were all fired, Jewish professors fired, uh, Jewish members of civil service, military all fired, and so on. Now, despite this agreement, I'll just show you one other image that I think is interesting. If you look at the anti-Semitic material because remember, the, the Italian state had not previously been anti-Semitic. So how were they going to spread the idea that Jews were this great danger? By the way, uh, there's only a tiny Jewish community in Italy at the time. There were about 40,000 Jews out of 40 million people, so one-tenth of one percent. It's the notion that the Jews were an evil influence, that special laws had to be uh, produced to uh, protect good Christian Italian society from. This was not a widespread idea. So the fascists in their anti-Semitic campaign relied very heavily on traditional uh, church anti-Semitic tropes, including the ritual murder one, which you see here. By the way, uh, the Nazis also used it in their uh, anti-Semitic materials. Now, uh, despite this agreement, as you might expect from what I said about the Pope earlier, the Pope was never fully comfortable with this agreement, um, certainly not comfortable with Mussolini getting closer and closer to Hitler fearing for what it would mean for the Italian people to be caught up in the Nazi uh, war and hate machine. And so he began to make noises about protesting. And in the book, I talk about this at some length because one thing that we now know from the Vatican archives is how furiously the people, the prelates around uh, the Pope worked to prevent him from publicly saying anything that might damage the alliance with the fascist regime and that might make Mussolini unhappy. But let me just end my remarks, and I won't leave time for, uh, for your questions, uh, with this one scene, which is, um, takes place in early 1939. Early 1939, the pope is now uh, elderly, he's ailing, uh, sickly, but he feels that he's made a terrible mistake that he has to warn the Italian people about the evils of the direction fascism is taking them in with Hitler. And so he summons all of the 350 bishops of Italy together along with the World Press Service for a historic speech he's going to make at St. Peter's uh, Basilica 
on the 10th anniversary of the Lateran Accord, remember the Lateran Accord was signed in uh, 1929, it was actually February 11th, so for f this speech by the Pope was going to be the 10th anniversary of the Lateran Accords, February 11th, 1939, a year, of course, that would mark the beginning of World War II later, and he's going to warn them. Now, what we know, and this is where triangulation of documents is so uh, revealing, we know from both Mu the uh, secret police files and from Mussolini's own correspondence that he was informed by the secret police that the Pope was about to denounce the church alliance with Mussolini and fascism, was about to denounce the increasing Italian embrace of Nazi Germany and at, in this speech, this very high profile speech. Uh, the Pope, as he's getting ready for this speech, which he writes by hand, is worried that his voice is getting too weak. You know, the acoustics in St. Peter's aren't very good. And so he orders the Vatican Printing Office to print up 350 copies of his speech to give to each of the bishops when they arrive on the 10th anniversary celebration. The day before this historic speech, on February 10th, 1939, the Pope dies. Now, the timing uh, in Italy has provoked a great amount of uh, conspiracy theorists, which I won't get into here. Um, for better or worse, I didn't find any evidence in the archives that uh, Mussolini played a role in the Pope's death. Mussolini hears the news. He actually hears the news while he's with his uh, mistress, um, which is not an uncommon place for him to be. Uh, he is uh, relieved happy the Pope has died, but he's worried. And this too we know from his own correspondence and diplomatic correspondence and from the fascist secret police reports in the Vatican. Why is he worried? Because he also heard about the 350 copies of the speech. What would happen, he wondered, if those copies of the speech which he thought were going to denounce his regime and his embrace of Hitler, what if they were to come out now it would be as if there was a prophecy from the tomb of the recently deceased pope. So they'd have all the greater impact. So uh, desperate, he sends his ambassador to the Holy See, we saw earlier, to meet with the one and only man in a position to help him. The man who for the past 10 years had been the number two in the Vatican, the pope's Cardinal Secretary of State, uh, now in charge of the Pope's belongings, a man whose name is Eugenio Pacelli. The ambassador tells him that Mussolini would be very pleased if he could order all copies of the Pope's speech destroyed. Now, of course, since I'm ending my remarks here and I want you to read the book, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> What then happened? Do you have to read the book? Uh, but I hope, <laughs> uh, with that teaser, um, to have given you in these you know, very brief uh, informal remarks some idea of both the drama of these years, the drama of the story, but also how one goes about trying to reconstruct this history. Uh, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Yes. You referred a couple of times to thousands of pages of research. I've read the book. There's a tremendous amount of coverage uh, in that. How do you uh, structure your own uh, work with assistance? Uh, mm -hmm. You can't do it solo, can you? Um, well, the writing of the book, yes, is solo, but in the research, there's, there's a kind of a brown parenthesis here, I guess, which is, um, I don't know if any of you put together the years from my <laughs> Wendy's introduction and, and the years I was discussing, but uh, I got a call, surprisingly, in the fall of 2006 that the then Provost of Brown, uh, Bob Zimmer, had just accepted the presidency of University of Chicago, and Ruth, uh, somewhat out of the blue, uh, then President Ruth Simmons, asked me to be provost, and one of my concerns was I was in the middle of this book project. I'd recently come back from the year working in the uh, state archives. They're about to open the Vatican archives. And um, so anyway, I, I did agree to do it for a five-year term. I'm glad I did. But I, always on my f 
feeling was this uh, burden, uh, not an unpleasant burden, but a burden of, I really wanted to get this book written. We, um, and so I did have uh, someone who worked side by side with me in the archives that year in Italy, uh, a PhD Italian uh, fascist historian, with, who continued to work part-time for me in those archives in the Vatican. Over that five-year period, we'd be in daily contact. And his job was to find the uh, documents of interest to me and have them digitized. So uh, there was that kind of help was important. But this is where computers come in. I mean, you know, let's imagine that I had 25,000 pages of you know, Xerox copies of these. I mean, what would you do? Um, not to mention, there are all sorts of other sources, published uh, diplomatic correspondence and so on that one uses. So now with digitization, I, I basically I prepare an index. I won't go into the details here, although I do with my graduate students of how you do this, because I think organization is absolutely crucial. Uh, and that index, which gives me for each document, you know, the date, uh, the subject, and then what, what the archival source is, it allows me to use that to organize my material and eventually when I'm actually writing to pull up one document after another. So I'll have on my screen you know, where I'm writing and then pulling up these documents and working with them as I'm writing. Yes? Hmm. Yeah, this, has every, did everybody hear the question? Um, the question is whether um, in my work I came to think of that Mussolini had always been anti-Semitic or whether this was a recent development perhaps linked to his uh, wanting to please Hitler. This is actually a big controversy among Italian historians. There was a book came out not long ago called the Mussolini Razzista, Mussolini the Racist, which tries to make the case that he was always anti-Semitic. Um, I actually don't think so. Now, there was a low, you might say, low level of anti-Semitism in Italy, as there was in the US at that time. Um, but, and he was certainly part of that. But remember, his, his most important um, mistress was Jewish. Uh, Margarita Sarfati was his mistress from uh, before he founded the fascist movement through the 1920s. And not just his mistress, but his probably most important political advisor. Uh, there were quite a few Jews who were in the fascist party. I mean, the proportion of Jews in the fascist movement were more or less the same as the general population. And there were fascist um, mayors and so on. So uh, I think something happened by the mid-1930s, and what I think that is is, in fact, uh, partly Mussolini's desire to please Hitler, partly his desire not just to please him by thinking he'd be happy that he similarly was anti-Semitic and doing things against the Jews, but also to show he was tough, because he increasingly felt that Mussolini, who had initially idolized him, was now thinking that Mussolini was the big brother, not, I mean, that uh, Hitler was the big brother, not Mussolini, and, he won and that the Italians were basically a weak people. This was the kind of Nazi view, and so he was trying to show how tough Italians were, and this is one way he used to show it. Yes? Yeah, it's a somewhat difficult question to answer. It's really a, a kind of cultural thing. I mean, one thing uh, yeah, I felt is the history of the church, history of the popes, is kind of too important to be left to church historians. Uh, now, there are many very good church historians, of course, uh, but they're looking at things from the point of view of the history of the church. The, the church occupies such an important part of certainly European history, and especially Italian, the Catholic Church in, in Italy, um, but, you know, for instance, a book came out in the uh, Revolution of 1848 in Rome when the Pope was kicked out of Rome, and it's a book on, on this revolution. It's by one of these, probably the best known historian in Italy, professor of the University of Rome, dealing with it, and there's not a single Vatican source mentioned. I mean, this is the story of the Pope, the Pope being kicked out, the Pope coming back, the Pope calling on the French and Austrians to restore him to power, but he never walks into a Vatican archive. Uh, this is part of a kind of a liberal, we might say, or they would say liberal uh, tradition of history. And uh, so it, it works on both sides. But 
There are, there are certainly a few uh, particularly younger scholars who are beginning to work in both, but still today I'm shocked by the extent to which this kind of ghettoization still happens. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, well, thanks. Um, there's a lot of uh, scuttlebutt about this in Rome. Um, one thing, uh, for example, for the last two summers, the Vatican secret archives have been, instead of they're normally closed for six weeks of the summer, they're closed for three months, which makes life kind of difficult for uh, scholars who don't live in Rome uh, since they're the summer months. But uh, the scuttlebutt is this is because they're getting things ready to, uh, for the announcement of the opening of the Pius XII archives. But those kind of rumors have been around now for quite a while, so you would think Francis would want to, to authorize it. Uh, the, the controversy over the canonization, beatification canonization of Pius XII you know, continues. Pius XII is the uh, hero of the conservative wing of the church. He was the last pre-Second Vatican Council pope, uh, last pope to really, from the conservative's point of view, uh, hold to the eternal verities of the church and not get into this multicultural, um, interreligious uh, mode. So there's, in a way, a lot at stake. And so I think this is what might be preventing Francis from having already opened it, because now it's been a while. The Pope, Pope Pius XII died in uh, 1958. So um, one hopes, to, and as for whether I'll write a book, uh, I'll certainly be tempted to see. Yes. Yeah, no, I actually haven't seen evidence of the Nazis having carted away in the way, you know, when Napoleon invaded Italy back in the late uh, 18th century, he did cart away all the uh, Vatican uh, secret archives and, uh, and other archives, but I'm not aware that the Nazis did. In fact, the one uh, hole I know about, uh, about that period, 1943, is remember I said that all, uh, there were thousands of these secret police folders on different, each one for a different person. So virtually all the top people in the Vatican have such a file other than the Pope, plus all the cardinals, bishops, and so on, you know, great, you know, juicy material. Uh, the one file I found missing was a file for Eugenio Pacelli, who certainly, we know, had a file. And what I discovered is that right after the fall of Mussolini in 43, so at the end of July 43, uh, a representative of the Vatican came to the then uh, temporary Minister of Internal Affairs and asked to be given the police file on Pacelli, who was then, of course, Pope, and was given it, and it's never been seen since. So that period did produce some of those kind of problems. Um, yes? Mm-hmm. Well, um, there's still a fair amount you could write that would shed light on this history. For example, in August 1943, if we just take that period, I was showing you the archival documents for this important period where the racial laws were about to be trotted out. Um, in mid-August 1943, the, excuse me, mid-August 1938, um, Los Verito Romano, which is the daily official, more or less official newspaper of the Vatican, published an article basically calling for anti-Semitic legislation. And, you know, it's read today, it's, I think, pretty hair-raising and scandalous. So, um, you know, the, there are sources like that. Um, the, again, there were already a certain amount of uh, printed diplomatic papers that one could have used, some of the Italian diplomatic correspondence. Uh, so one, one I think could get the general contours of what went on without these archives, but a lot of the, you know, for example, that document I showed you of the accord reached in mid-August 
about the racial laws uh, by Taki Venturi on behalf of the Pope with Mussolini, it's uh, really, I think, provides a kind of answer to debates that you just weren't going to get by any uh, published materials. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. You often um, encounter this both with popes and kings and so on, that, you know, the king is basically benevolent under the pope, but it's their evil advisors who are, uh, account for any unpleasantness. Um, I mean, one of the problems probably with this book is there are not a lot of heroic figures in the book. Now, um, that said, I see Pius XI as a very complex uh, person and ultimately a tragic figure because uh, the way I see it, he came into office with a certain kind of still medieval church perspective on the world that didn't really prepare him for the new totalitarianisms that were about to sweep Europe and in fact um, served him very poorly and he eventually comes to realize this but, but too late. Um, but in terms of you know, the heroic figures, actually the um, American jazz, although the Italian jazz would come out very poorly in my book, I'd say, the American jazz would come out pretty well. Uh, I mentioned that there was actually an anti-fascist editor of the Jesuit Periodical America. Uh, also, some of you may have heard of the uh, famous secret encyclical. Uh, I didn't get into this, but Pius XI, in, at the same time as these racial laws, the new racial policy was being formulated, decided he wanted to issue an encyclical uh, denouncing racism and anti-Semitism. Uh, he kept this secret from his Secretary of State, Cardinal Pacelli, who he didn't think would approve. And what does he do? He calls on an American Jesuit, actually from Rhode Island, uh, John Lafarge, who had previously written a book about um, anti-racism, anti-racism against blacks in the United States, and called on him. It was like a shot, a shock, because he had no previous Vatican experience calls him in and asks him to prepare an encyclical. Um, and in the book, I tell the story of how that encyclical was basically undermined. But um, so there are uh, you know, positive figures, certainly within the uh, church at the time. I don't really get into the anti-fascist uh, movement. What's interesting in, in fascism in this story is that there were a lot of anti-clerical fascists still. So Mussolini, who came from this anti-clerical background, once needs the church as an ally, but some of his fellow fascists are not at all happy with this and uh, still are trying to undermine that understanding from the fascist side. Curiously, from the Vatican's perspective, these were the left-wing fascists. The problem with fascism from a Vatican perspective at the time were the left-wing fascists who were regarded as the anti-clerics. We're all done? Be the evil timekeeper. Okay. So <laughs>